Hey everybody, welcome back to 90 and Out. I'm your host, Timothy Holtz, and this channel is all about looking at the Christian Bible and trying to understand what it means. The who, what, where, when, and why of these ancient documents. So, I'm a youth pastor at Six Points Church. Uh, if you've been following this channel for a while now, uh, you know the routine. However, for those of you who haven't, Feel free and have a civil conversation in the comments that YouTube provides or Facebook um, in those sections. I would love to hear from you. Good, bad, ugly, and different. Go down to that section and uh, let me know your thoughts on the subject matter of this video or any of the other videos on this channel. If there's a subject you would like me to cover, let me know. Also, as the youth pastor of Six Points, our teens suggested going through Paul's two letters to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 for this video, and uh, you can check out both playlists in the list provided wherever YouTube happens to put the cards. Now, uh, chapter 7 is going to be pretty interesting. I have it, uh, I'm getting it pulled up here right behind the camera. And we're going to be looking at that, um, the actual text. By actual text, I'm referring to the English translation, specifically the New King James Version. If you use a different English translation, let me know in the comments. I would love to compare and contrast those with you. Uh, the teens during our youth night are encouraged to bring their own Bibles, no matter what that translation is, so we can compare and contrast the different interpretations of the ancient Greek in this case. So, check it out and uh, let me know which version you like to use. Keep in mind we're looking at the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. Um, so, who is pretty simple. It's Paul, um, also known as Saul of Tarsus. He's the primary writer in this case and is credited with its composition. He is not alone in his writing. I believe Timothy helped him with 2 Corinthians. Let's double check here. Um, just for reference sake. Yeah, Timothy uh, says right at the very beginning, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, the apostle of Christ, Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So Paul and Timothy are tag-teaming this letter. Uh, let's get right to it and start reading chapter 7. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. I do not say this to condemn, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together, and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced ever more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a little while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, 
that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication in all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Therefore, we have been confronted, comforted in your comfort, and we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit had been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true, and his affections are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all. With how, how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore, I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. What is Paul talking about here? Um, and why should we care? So let's look at the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. So, who is obviously Paul and Timothy writing to the Christian church in Corinth? Uh, letters in ancient Rome would be read aloud upon their reception, so the courier would just start reading. They would gather the audience together, who it's addressed to, and then they would just start reading. That's why if you notice the Pauline letters as well as the other letters um, from John and Peter and the like, all have this, like, flow to them, this poetic um, conversational flow. That's because they're letters. They were written to be read aloud. So um, chapter 7 is in the middle of this letter. Yeah, it's a long letter, but it was also very expensive to write letters. So there you go. Um, however, he starts out uh, giving some vague reference to a previous letter. Um, uh, he even says that he regretted sending it, but in hindsight, it was probably a good idea. Um, you can look at verses 8 through 10, it looks like. Okay, um, 8 and 9. This is not 1 Corinthians. This is another letter that has been lost to time. Um, probably because uh, it was pretty harsh and they didn't keep it. So, however, Paul is commending the Christians in Corinth not because they were sinful, not because they were low-life dirtbags, but because they repented. Um, beloved, he speaks highly of them. I get this uh, picture of my dad sitting with me at, a, at our kitchen table um, in Radcliffe, at the farmhouse where I grew up. We had this solid wood um, oak table. Uh, it was a beautiful table. Seated all six of us uh, in this relatively small eat-in kitchen. Table took up most of the space. Um, if you're on one side of the table, your back would be against the stove. And if you're on the other side of the table, uh, your back would be up against the washer and dryer. So um, typically... Dad would sit on one side of the table, and um, one of my brothers or I would sit on the other side of the table for a table talk. Um, generally speaking, when Dad said, hey, uh, we need to talk, it took place at the kitchen table. And I get this kind of Pauline-esque um, atmosphere coming from this letter, like Paul is writing to them like he would be writing to his kids, like he would be have a, hey, we need to sit down and talk kind of talk with them. Um, so these table talks were not always chastisements. They were not always uh, butt chewings. Sometimes they were praise, and uh, oftentimes they were encouraging. 
um, I have fond memories of these conversations, even when I was on the uh, disciplinary side of things. Um, they were overall good things. And I get this impression that Paul is taking this approach like a dad would his kids. Yeah, they screwed up. Yeah, they made a mess of things. If you've been around teenagers very long, guess what? They're really good at doing that uh, and making a mess of things. So um, I get that. And he says, um, you know, he talks about repentance, uh, sorrow, godly sorrow, um, leading to vindication and desire and zeal and um, salvation. I remember one time I came home and dad said, hey, we need to talk. And he was already at the table. And I was like, oh, great. And I sat down and he goes, hey, you know, he was uh, started talking and he said, is there anything you want to tell me about school and what's going on? And um, I didn't really want to talk. And then finally he said, you know, you might as well just spill it. Uh, you're graduating. I was like, oh, okay. It was one of those conversations of, oh, I'm not in trouble? Nice. Um, but in all reality, he was proud of me, and he wanted to tell me that, yeah, sounds like a car alarm going off outside, but that's all right. Um, he wanted to let me know how proud he was that I was um, making this achievement and taking these actions. At first, he was pretty hesitant to support it, uh, it was pretty unconventional, and I did have to fight quite a bit with um, the school board and the counselor at the school and the administration, but overall, it was successful, and he took that approach, and that was one of these table talks. Um, I didn't always do well, and however, um, he was like, you know, you screwed up, you know you screwed up, but it's a good thing because you learned from it. Um, and I get that impression from Paul here. He's talking about being comforted, and he's, you can just, I mean, you can probably tell by how I read it. That was a cold read, by the way. Um, a cold read is where you haven't read something in a very long time, and you just pick it up and start reading it uh, out loud. Um, that was a cold read. And as I read it, you could probably ca get that, that, enthusiasm and excitement that just flows off the page um, with what Paul's talking about here. We have wronged no one. He starts this discord off with this uh, rant, basically. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one, corrupted no one, cheated no one. Yeah. Um, he, he is... But there were fears on the inside, conflicts on the outside, right? Then he starts talking about this Titus character. Um, have you ever been in a place in your life where things just seem to go to crap? Um, and then all of a sudden somebody that you know shows up and just changes your entire perspective. Well, that was Titus for... for uh, Paul and Timothy, and for the Corinthians, uh, the Christians at Corinthians, at Corinth. He, he became that person that just vindicated everything and brought it all back to Christ and God. So, I'm, I'm just super excited with uh, how much compassion and love and grace Paul is showing to the Corinthians here. Um, if you look at the rest of the letter, the first half of the letter, this is the halfway point in this letter. The first half of the, of the letter, he's talking about how they're screwing up, how they're just screwing up. Um, and he uses chapter 7 as a transition to, you know, it's not all bad, guys. There's some really good things going on. Um, holiness, perfecting holiness. Wow. Hey, um, and he uses the, the beginning right here. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That is the transition point. And at some point in time in our lives, in your life, in my life, we have to do that. 
we have to take all the filthiness in our lives and just pitch it and just pitch it. Just give it the boot, the heave-ho, and then pursue perfecting holiness in God. Because guess what? There's going to be a day when every knee will bow, and uh, I would much rather do it willingly than be forced to, because God's awesome, people, okay? You want to talk about boldness of speech and boasting, you know? I, I just get this picture of Paul just being their cheer squad, okay? Um, yesterday was a football game that my son did not get to play because of reasons he was not eligible to play. However, his team won, and when there was a touchdown scored, the stands were uproarish. Um, they were boasting on the achievement, and guess what? We need to do that with each other and encourage each other no matter what's going on in our lives because if we look at the gutter, all we're going to get is the stuff in the gutter. But if we let it go away, then so be it. I mean, I'd much rather look at the grocery cart full of groceries than look at the septic tank full of crap. So don't wallow in the mud. Achieve Heights, and uh, may God bless you. Thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of this. Please comment. I'd love to discuss this matter with you further. Also, if you know any teenagers or you are a teenager in Western Pennsylvania, come check out Fear Fest at Six Points Church in Parker, Pennsylvania, October 27th. I'll be speaking about fear for a short time, but we're also going to have some food and games and fun. So come check it out. And... Um, Find a place for you to belong. Fear Fest is an acronym. Uh, fear is an acronym. False evidence appearing real. So no matter what's going on in your life, when you feel overcome by fear, just remember, it's false evidence appearing real. In Christ, we have nothing to fear and everything to gain because he is God and God is awesome. So I'm Timothy Holt with Six Points Church and 90 and Out. May God bless you. If you are a teenager, find one of those wise adults and study them. Be discipled by them. If you're one of those wise adults, find a teenager to bring, you, bring alongside you and mentor for the rest of life. How's that saying go? Oh, yeah. Life is a play. All the world is a stage. And you are just one of the actors in it. May God bless you. Get out and disciple someone today.